Right, this one is um, the second part of uh, the, the kidney one, really. Osmoregulation, which is fairly straightforward, but there's a lot in here. Okay, so osmoregulation is all about um, control of water uh, and salt levels in the body. Remember, water and salt uh, are both interrelated. Um, if you've got a, a liquid with lots of salt in it, uh, let's this out. Let's do like this. Um, here's salts. Um, let's use blue for water, why not? So if we've got a combination of some salty water there, we could describe that as being dilute. If, however, we added more salt, it would become more concentrated. And the opposite is the case. If we had something that was very concentrated and we removed salt, it would become more dilute. Now, the sources of water going into your body uh, are fairly straightforward. We get it in our food, we get it in our um, liquids that we drink, and... We also get some from metabolism. Really, this is talking about respiration. Remember, in uh, respiration, when we break down uh, oops, the old uh, familiar one, we get water from it. Okay, This is a source of water for um, a lot of desert animals, camels, that kind of stuff. They break down fat rather than glucose, but it releases water. That's another source of water going in. Uh, we lose water through a variety of places. So we would lose water in our urine, um, sweating, um, as we breathe out, exhaling air, and in feces. Okay, so we're constantly trying to balance these two things in the amount we take in, or the amount that goes into our body, and the amount that's lost. Now, we've already obviously taught um, when we did the kidney about the amount of water that's reabsorbed, for example, in the, the proximal convoluted tubule. And we talked about the loop of Henle and how as you go further down the uh, kidney it becomes saltier and water is reabsorbed there. Uh, the last stage of this happens in the collecting duct. So here's, you know, let's go through it all again, the nephron, loop of Henle, and then it ends up in this nice big collecting duct. And perhaps this is getting stuff from, from several nephrons. Um, the collecting duct can also reabsorb water. And this is the final stage and this is where ADH um, will have its, have its role. ADH, the hormone released from uh, the pituitary, from the posterior pituitary. Um, this is the bit it's going to affect. So what does it do? Okay, well, first of all, in order to detect the levels, to detect the stimulus of too little water, we need a receptor cell. Receptor cells involved are called osmoreceptors. And they'll detect um, the if you like, how much water there is in blood vessels. We've actually got quite a few receptors that can do various things, such as detect uh, the, the pressure in the blood, and they do feed into that a bit. But the main ones we're interested in here are the, these osmoreceptors, and they're found in the hypothalamus, which is a region of the brain um, involved in quite a few um, monitoring processes of the body. For example, a lot of the, the information about body temperature comes to the hypothalamus. So osmoreceptors found in um, the hypothalamus of the brain. Now, What's going to happen is, if we detect that we have low levels of water, we basically need to prevent ourselves from losing any more. And the way we prevent it is by trying to shut down or um, lower the amount of urine we produce, because we lose quite a bit of water through this. So, if we have low water, we release ADH anti-diuretic hormone. You might come across it if you're looking at this stuff on the internet um, being called something called vasopressin. But we can refer to it as ADH. It's just an alternative name for it. It's probably the American name to be honest. Um, we're going to use ADH anti-diuretic hormone. I think the way perhaps to help you remember it, it's the way I remembered it, if you think of anti means against and it's something to do with urine so anti-urine, it stops you weighing as much, stops you producing as much urine, or stops you putting as much water into your urine. We'll come back to that in a second. Okay, it is released from, I think I mentioned this before, the posterior pituitary. Now, the pituitary um, is a gland. Um, as we know, glands can secrete release um, substances either um, straight into the blood or into a duct. So when we talked about, um, for example, things like saliva, uh, enzymes in the pancreas released into a duct, um, 
or we can release things to the blood like we talked about the pancreas releasing um, <coughs> excuse me I've forgotten the name of it now glucagon and um, insulin straight into the blood the diagram in your book I don't think is helpful here because it seems to be back to the front but the, the pituitary gland which kind of sits let me draw a quick brain it kind of is about there if that's, that's your brain brilliant drawn is it but it's there there's the pituitary posterior means um, rear or behind so if I made that a bit larger so I'm looking at this pituitary here it's it's this side of it the, the rear end in your book for some reason they've drawn it the other way around which I don't know why they, they, they just have like that I think that makes more sense I'm, I'm used to seeing the brain looking that way at uh, the front if you want to know it's called the anterior pituitary which has got a different role we'll, you'll find much more about that later so the posterior pituitary what you have in here is some cells which are neurons okay and they're called neuro secretory cells so they're they're very much like the neurons we've come across before except um, instead of a, a an action potential a nerve impulse traveling down here and reaching the end and then it releases neurotransmitter what it does is up here it manufactures ADH and the ADH is transported down to the end and it sits down here waiting. When this becomes stimulated by um, the osmoreceptors, so the osmoreceptors would be um, connected here, when it becomes stimulated it causes the ADH to be released from the end terminal into the blood. Hence neurosecretory cell. Although it's a neuron it also secretes. Okay, So this is happening in the posterior pituitary in the brain. Um, it, it's thought that the way that these osmoreceptor cells work is, um, let, let's just, let's imagine this is our osmoreceptor. There it is. Um, it's not the best drawing, is it? And in the conditions and the, the, the fluid on the outside, if you like, um, it becomes low salt conditions. Uh, sorry, it becomes high salt conditions. In other words, low water because we're losing too much water. If it's becoming very uh, concentrated salt out here, we will tend to lose water because the outside is more concentrated in salt than the inside, if you like. It's like, you remember, putting cells into um, salty conditions. If you put them into hypertonic solution, it will shrivel. It will shrink up. And it's thought that it, it's something to do with that kind of shrinking is what will uh, cause these osmoreceptor cells to stimulate these neurosecretory cells. It's a bit like, um, as well, pressure receptors, paxinian corpuscles in the hand, remember, uh, in your skin. If you touch them, they will compress. Okay, And, and that's what causes those um, touch receptors to, send, uh, to, to generate an action potential. Same kind of idea here. We've changed the... Um, shape of the osmoreceptor it's it's lost water and that's what we think and um, is causing the signal um so i'm going to do another one part two to this to show what happens in the um collecting duct <laughs>